Hello there. Uh, my name is Mick Napier from the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Um, I've been invited by Ziad Patel to share a few words and ideas with you. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. These are hard times, not just in Palestine, but across the entire Middle East and, and way beyond with the new man in the White House. And it's very easy to succumb to despair. Palestinian disunity, permanent Israeli encroachment, house demolitions, massacre, and so on. But I think South Africans know, you've been through extremely dark times yourself, that it's not the most vicious and the most militarily powerful side in a struggle for liberation that wins. In fact, quite often it's, it's the weaker side militarily. Uh, steadfastness, popular organisation, resistance and determination can be decisive. So I think uh, we should avoid the inclination to despair, perhaps, as someone once said, um, save it for better times. We can't really afford the luxury at the moment. Um, the horror is, is undeniable. Um, we don't, I don't want to get into the detail, but suffice it to say that the Israeli Minister of Defence appointed against harsh opposition um, a spiritual guide, a chief spiritual guide for the Israeli military called Eyal Karim, a rabbi who had gone on record as, rec as endorsing the use of rape against Palestinian women if it boosted uh, military morale. So these are harsh times in terms of the horror inside Israel-Palestine, openly genocidal language from the top of the Israeli government. Um, it's also a time when governments are moving more closely towards um, support for Israel. Um, not just the US, but my own government here is planning to celebrate the centenary of the Balfour Declaration, which opened up uh, Palestine to European colonization. Um, for a very long time, we've seen this alliance um, quite determined and even a militant alliance between European and, and uh, North American governments in Israel. As far ago as as far as long ago, sorry, as 2003, I recall that the EU conducted an opinion poll among its uh, citizens right across uh, every country from Lithuania to Ireland at that time and asked them which country was, among other questions, asked them which country was the greatest threat to world peace. 59% of Europeans in the opinion poll chose Israel, uh, but so uncomfortable was the EU with this uh, position, this popular position by its citizens, they apologised to Israel for the opinions of European citizens and said that this was something that would have to be dealt with. So this, this uh, gulf between popular opinion and hostility and critical attitudes towards Israel and the alignment of regimes with the state of Israel is very long-standing. Um, the, the year after that opinion poll, of course, um, the International Court of Justice uh, found in fav found against the Israelis and decided and ruled that the, the apartheid wall was a crime and enjoined every citizen, every government, sorry, that was affiliated with the, the International Court to take concrete and specific steps to have the wall taken down and uh, restitution and damages paid to the Palestinians, who many of whose lives have been wrecked by it. The response of the EU, the USA, was to increase arms sales uh, to the state of Israel, to reward Israel um, and to fly in the face of international law. That, of course, was the genesis of the, international, of the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment and sanctions. Now, I think we face um, what seems to be um, a very serious challenge, but I actually regard it as a tremendous opportunity. And that is that we are now having to fight not just for BDS and to try to secure further victories, but also to fight for the right to campaign against the state of Israel and to campaign for BDS and even to challenge from a democratic perspective the racist nature of the Zionist project in Palestine. But I think that, that this is an opportunity. I'm old enough to have been involved in the campaign against the war in Vietnam. And I remember that we organised meetings that were quite small and quite marginal until repression in the USA, until repression at the University of Berkeley led to the free speech movement 
after the authorities there barred, banned, uh, prohibited all meetings on campus dealing with the war. And when the issue of Vietnam became fused with the issue of free speech, numbers of people involved uh, increased dramatically. Modest meetings became large and large meetings became huge. I think the same, uh, the same logic is at work here, that if we stand our ground um, against this attack on our free speech, uh, then I think we can, we, we can take the, the uh, Palestine solidarity campaign, the movement to, to a higher level. Um, because the, the Israelis certainly see a crisis. Um, two ambassadors ago in Britain, we had a guy called uh, Ron Prosser, who was, I think, promoted uh, to be Israeli ambassador at the UN. Just immediately before his departure, he sounded the alarm to the British government. And he, he compared Britain, but he could the, the, the metaphor could equally well apply to many, many other countries, perhaps most countries around the world. But he said that Britain was like a high-rise building where in the penthouse, uh, the apartments at the top, relations were great as far as Israel was concerned with governments, corporations and so on. But he said every other floor was, I can't remember the exact term, but something like infused with toxic anti-Israel hatred, by which he meant that the rest of society was critical and hostile towards what Israel was doing to the Palestinians. And he said if that uh, popular opinion continued or intensified, it would create... Uh, a crisis in state-to-state -state relations, even though at that time they were they were actually smooth. So I think that's the, that's Israel's Achilles heel. I think that points us towards the area where we can build um, uh, an effective solidarity campaign, basing ourselves on individuals and social institutions, which we can assume, although um, we, we need to check, but we can assume is is in the main hostile to what the state of Israel is doing. Here in Scotland, we've been involved in economic boycott with, of course, people around the world against Veolia. Other, um, we've scored other successes or had signs of successes against other um, uh, corporations. Uh, we've done sporting boycott, cultural boycott. But I think all underpinning our approach, and I think it should be a key aim for all of us, has been the notion that morale is key in a struggle um, such as the Palestinians are involved in. And that the, the primary role of the BDS movement is to send a message across the walls, again, across the prisons, um, into the prisons, that it's Israel that's isolated internationally. Pr friends who have been political prisoners assure me that prison is hard, but it's a totally different experience to think that you've been ignored and forgotten about compared to when you can hear shouts like, you know, outside the prison walls of solidarity and support, it makes it much, much more bearable. And I think if we look at the history of South Africa, uh, the history of the, you know, the political prisoners, when word of developing BDS campaigns around the world reached the prisoners, it had a, a tremendous effect on morale. And I think in Palestine, the whole society in prison uh, benefits from messages from, from, from BDS successes cultural, economic, sporting, and so on, that it's Israel uh, which faces huge hostility around the world. Um, and I think we also, as well as sustaining Palestinian morale, we can damage the, the, the morale of the Zionist bloc by showing that if Israel continues along the same path, it will pay an increasing cost in terms of its pariah status, in terms of the... the um, Stati statistics which we hear already that say a very large proportion of Israeli uh, young people are far from proud of their state um, and are and many of them have second passports and are inclined to leave. Um, so I think the the horror of the Israeli occupation, um, the deep um, enduring complicity of our states uh, with what Israel is doing to the Palestinians um, comes up against this popular opinion, this block of popular opinion, uh, which is the rock on which the whole project, the whole of their project can, can founder. And I think we learn from the South African experience that, of course, liberation has to be the act of the oppressed themselves, but that international boycott campaigns can provide a useful auxiliary role, can play a useful auxiliary role along the lines that I've just suggested. Um, 
I think the campaign has been tremendously successful um, since 2005 when it was launched, the year after the International Court of Justice uh, ruling, pre precisely a year afterwards. Um, the, 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 the numbers of people around the world, the universities, the trade unions and so on, um, who have adopted BDS positions has given the Israelis great food for thought. Um, but I think we can go so much further. Uh, we lack international real-time coordination um, so that, for example, when an Israeli cultural group, a musical, an orchestra, uh, whatever, takes a European and international tour, we lack the, uh, the facility at the moment to, to make that tour impossible, to ensure that in city after city where these Israeli state-sponsored uh, cultural ambassadors turn up, they, they become unable to perform, that it, it's, it results in very large demonstrations, angry demonstrations. And I think it's possible to produce a crisis in the Israeli public in terms of um, morale by organising to a much higher level internationally. That's not easy. We see this happening in embryo, with, uh, especially in the case of musicians who intend to perform in Israel, and we can reach them when they come to our cities here in Europe. But in the opposite direction, when Israeli groups tour, such international coordination in real time could be cumulatively very, very impressive. But we're, we're not there yet. Um, so I would argue that there is no international community as such. Um, we have to distingu distinguish uh, between the elites and, and popular opinion. So, for example, uh, Richard Falk, who came here to Scotland recently to speak, who was the UN Rapporteur for Human Rights in Palestine, um, published a report commissioned by a, a key institute inside the United Nations, uh, finding that Israel was not only an apartheid state in the areas conquered after 67, but operated apartheid policies and structures across the whole of historic Palestine. The report was suppressed, I think, by Guterres um, at, the, at the head of the United Nations under massive pressure uh, from the USA, the EU, Britain and, and other states. Um, so this solidarity with the state of Israel extends into the, uh, the upper echelons of the United Nations and I think renders it uh, not a useful forum at the moment. That could change. Um, in order to win solidarity with the people of Palestine. A breakthrough is possible in the future, but at the moment, uh, Richard Falk's report has, has been suppressed. And there is an internationalism of Netanyahu, Donald Trump, May, and Obama, of course, before Trump, uh, which is very real, billions strong, military, diplomatic, political, and, and, and so on. But that popular opinion still threatens to break the project. Um, still threatens to produce problems in state-to-state -state relations if we continue to build the, the, the BDS movement. Um, just an example. Um, in 2006, you may remember the Israelis invaded and massacred many, many thousands of people in Lebanon. Um, at that time, uh, pro-Palestine uh, campaigners in Derry, a city in the north of Ireland, uh, invaded a local Raytheon arms factory, a fairly small factory, but involved in the overall production of, of uh, Raytheon's uh, armaments, and smashed up the factory, threw computers out of windows, did a quarter of a million pounds worth of damage, and went to trial. When they went to trial, the jury found them unanimously not guilty. Uh, the jury accepted the argument that if you're passing by a door behind which you hear a child being abused, it is proper and it's your duty to smash down that door and violate the rights of property, if you like, to prevent a much greater crime. And the pro-Palestine activists in the north of Ireland were exonerated um, and set free. Um, the same thing happened later with another occupation of the factory, which forced that arms company, subsequently Raytheon, to withdraw from, uh, from the city of Derry. During Operation Cast Lead, two years later, 2008-2009, um, the same thing happened in a city in the south of England, uh, uh, Brighton, 
where dedicated activists invaded a local fa arms factory there and repeated the, the same operation through computers out of windows. They had learned from Derry, uh, went to trial. And not only did the jury find them unanimously not guilty on the, based on the same arguments that they were taking action that was a violation of property to prevent a much greater crime, a war crime by Israel against the people of Gaza, uh, but the judge in the case, a judge called uh, Judge Bathurst Norman, um, gave directions to the jury, which I wish I had been able to write. I think many of you would wish you had been able to write, would completely subscribe to, and which Scottish PSE uh, published as a pamphlet, verbatim his directions to the jury. He compared Israel to the Nazis, uh, which is increasingly likely to become a crime here in Britain. Um, he uh, went through the whole litany of crimes that Israel had committed in Gaza. He spoke to the jury and said, that he, it was very important that they judge the matter as an issue of law and that they not be influenced by any sense of shame at the role of the British government in sustaining and supporting Israel in its criminality. And the jury, as I say, found the defendants also in that case unanimously not guilty. So I think we can conclude that public opinion is hugely with us, that Israel has powerful allies in, in corporate in corporate Britain, America, and in South Africa, um, uh, in governments, but that when we reach out to trade unions, to churches, to mosques, to uh, members and sections of political parties whose leaders may be in bed with Israel, but whose rank and file members tend overwhelmingly to support the people of Palestine, then we can win and we can build uh, a very effective campaign for Palestine solidarity. Here in Glasgow, we have Mandela uh, Place, um, which was named while the apartheid embassy was still situated there. And to their great chagrin, the apartheid ambassador or consuls had to receive mail to the South African consulate address Nelson Mandela Place. Um, we don't have a Palestine place yet, uh, but one day we will. Uh, Palestine will be free. People like you, and with in, in South Africa, you have a, a unique moral authority, having been part of a struggle to overthrow one vicious and brutal form of racism, state-enforced racism that we know as apartheid, and your voice is especially critical um, in support of the struggle of the people of Palestine. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share a few words with you. Um, I look forward to meeting you, if not face to face, given the huge distances between us, at least as different detachments in the same field of battle against the apartheid system in historic Palestine. I hope you have a useful conference and I hope that we can develop relations of struggle together. I know you, you have um, campaigned against the Jewish National Fund, a racist pillar of Israeli apartheid, which is a charity in South Africa, a charity in Britain and the charity in 40 odd other countries. We can work together, um, have a good conference, and I hope our paths will continue to cross.